Thank you so much, Ram. Uh, it's actually my honor and my pleasure to be here and joining this talk with all of you, and I hope that you like it. So, as Ram has mentioned, uh, my talk today is about like actually AI and, and uh, artificial intelligence and anatomical pathology, and trying to give a glance at what I call the present, not the future, of pathology in general. Just a couple of housekeeping regulation. No, I don't have any financial relationship. Even that I'm gonna discuss a lot of new companies and a lot of new uh, entities now. So let's just dive deeper. So my first introduction about artificial intelligence was that movie, The Terminator of like 1986. Let's talk about like an AI built in the US defense system to enhance US army and empower like, um, by its power called by something called Skynet. Skynet, however, in the mid 90s started developing what we call like uh, self aware, and it determined that humans are dangerous, make mistakes all the time, and illogic. So the machine decided to that robots and machines, the, the machine decided that to create robots, machines, and algorithms against human, and human are on the verge of extinction now. Now, after almost 40 years of that movie, you can call the pathology version of that movie, in which like AI built into A, B, and C, B workflow to improve the pathology job. However, AI did indeed develop what we call the self-reward system to improve algorithm outcomes, which like, in general, which has actually happened very recently in the last five years, and we call it like the transformers. So the Transformers is a specific type of neural network that was developed five years ago. Ironically, it's the same T versus the Terminator of the movie. It's also the same T that you can use in, if all of you are familiar with what we call ChatGPT, which is Generative Pre-trained Transformers. Anyhow, AI determined that the pathologists are dangerous, huge inter and inter-observer variability. We do make mistakes all the time. Multiple forms of wasting of turnaround time that even 10 times like the wasting of time that machine can do. So the machine created models and algorithms to do the pathologist's job and the pathologist's job are in the verge of extension. And if this didn't scare you well, these pictures actually was created by an AI algorithm in which like I fitted actually the word Arnold Schwarzenegger as a pathologist fighting AI and to give me these pictures in. However, is it really a threat? This is the question that I want to like ask for everyone. Through the history of nature, through the history of human being, we always have this dilemma about the fear of the unknowns. A good question of this happened in the 19th centuries in the Britain, like in the Great Britain, which what we called like the Lotus Rites, in which like machine breaking disturbance that rocked the wool and the cotton industry in which like these people were so afraid of the machine that it will make everything, every person is employee. And these are not slugs or sieves. These are actually normal human beings. Actually, some of them were priests in which they believe that these machines has the devil inside them. And they believe it's the word of God to burn these machines. And why not moving like that far away? Well, here in Seattle, in Seattle Washington, Seattle, almost 40 years ago, there was a calculated mass teachers like protest in which more than 60,000 mass teachers from all over the country as well as in Canada came against the use of calculator and forbid the use of it and said that the using of calculator will hurt the education and pretty much make the human stupid. If that's not like the picture that you can see with the technology, let's say just one decade ago with the invention of Uber, in which like the innovation of dispersed mobility service like Uber led to severe frustration in the taxi service industry or over the world. And there's a severe global hostility protest. And I do remember that some Uber taxi like driver at the time used to hide their identity because other taxi drivers were smashing their cars. However, realistically speaking, the evolution of this new technology spent it for the mobility industry into service transplant, ride hauling, food delivery, package, bus mails, freight transport, and realistically, the overall industrial of like dispersed mobility increased the job gain four times. It didn't actually lose like jobs at all. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is what my crown say is whenever there's a change, there's always uncertainty. And whenever there's change and whenever there's uncertainty, 
there is always opportunity. And this is where we as a human, we actually inhale because we can very well adapt and we have the social awareness to develop new skills. So let's just start about what we're gonna talk here. I'm gonna finish, give you a couple of definitions to tell you what's going on. Then I'm gonna dive deep about like some pathology specific use of artificial intelligence. I'm gonna give you like some of the most recent vendor products so we get an idea about what's happening in the market now. Then I'm gonna talk about like what I believe very important, which is the six ethical is consideration and the six AI commandments. And maybe at the end we will talk about like the AI implementation, how to have an SOB if you want to try to work on any AI model and a conclusion of all of this. So let's start with a couple of definition. Data scientists pretty much is just analyzing massive data to extract knowledge. Anything that we are doing when we are writing a report or we are working on the microscope, this is data scientists by default. If you are analyzing data to get the knowledge out of it, it is data science. I'm not gonna dive about different tools of using data science, but there's something called data analytics and there's something called expert system. However, if we dive deeper, we will find something called artificial intelligence, which is pretty much computer performed human task. So believe it or not, 40 years ago, this like calculator that was in our hands is indeed an artificial intelligence. Now we don't even believe that it's artificial intelligence. Now, machine learning is a subdivision of artificial intelligence in which the computers now develop an algorithm that can create a task or can simulate a human task. So this is the machine by themselves or the computer are trying to create like a sort of a code for them to emulate what we are doing. Deep learning is a subspeciality or a division of machine learning in which it's just a specific sets of algorithms that using huge data or big data per se. And there's a specific one, it's called neural network, and we will talk actually about the pioneer, the scientist pioneer of the neural network technology in a second. So neural network is a set of deep learning algorithm inspired by the human central nervous system, which is creation of neurons that just fire against each other. Again, the most one that I want you to focus on now is the transformers or neural network transformers, which is a new technology that came in the first publication in 2017. So it's type of deep learning model. It's very common to use in national language processing. However, it's very important or unique in the feature of something called self-attention or self-aware, in which by itself, it can know the value of the inputs that you are trying to put in order to get the desired output that you use. The generative modeling technology or the transformers technology is one of the keystones in this new era that we all hear now about ChatGPT, Midway, or sorry, Midjourney, or Ibn AI, or all these new like artificial intelligence technologies. However, without going farther into like what we have now, there's some of important definition that we need to focus on. There's difference between the word narrow versus general versus strong AI. Narrow pretty much is just a simple task, something like ER and PR uh, algorithm to detect an immune histochemistry staining. We call this narrow. General AI is the whole workflow. In another word, diagnosis of endocarcinoma with all like the related issues with how we can diagnose this disease or not. However, strong AI is actually taking the whole thing and outperform what human is doing. Currently, most of AI models in healthcare are narrow AI, some of them are general AI, and as far as I know, we did not perform a strong AI in the healthcare system. However, the one thing that I want you to focus on this slide is the difference between autonomous AI and augmented AI, which will come really in handy later to see and how to deploy all these AIs. Autonomous AI is that there is no human in the loop. We leave the machine to take the decision from A to Z. Something like the verifying of the CBC reports that we have in the CB report, for example. Sometimes that can happen. However, the augmented AI, which is keep the human in the loop, is where you need the machine, you need the human to take decision, which is something like reflex ask us after, or LCL. So after like the screener or see the whole smear of the cytopathology, if they saw ask us or high cell, they reflex it to a human that he or she must prove that this is high grade or not. Further, Last but not least, the Tesla effect or the Tesla theorem. It's this, this concept that AI is whatever hasn't been done yet. We don't think Dragon is an AI. We don't think 
can create as AI. We don't think all of the technology that we have now AI. However, it's all of it. But we are scared of what we just saw now. And very soon, we will not get scared, but we will get scared with something else. So with this idea in your mind, let's actually dive into pathology-specific uses. There's many of them, but I would try actually to bundle them into eight, four categories to each. So the first two is the image analysis or pattern recognition, then the predictive modeling of the survivor of the patients. Another two is time-consuming tasks or automation in general, as well as quality control. The third two is our image managing system and robots and scanners. The last two is clinical decision support and natural language processing. So let's dive deeper into the first one. So image analysis and pattern cognition, which diagnosis detection, is pretty much as the algorithm can identify features such as cell morphology, tissue architecture, staining pattern. Something like we all have in our iPhone or iPhones when you are putting your face in front of the camera and it recognizes the features of your face. Something like Google Pictures, for example, when you are seeing like picture, different picture, and they can define that this is a bird and this is a pencil or whatever. The same technology that using the pixelation quantity to create an algorithm to diagnose what is this is what we are having now, but of course on different scale. So without going farther, from a clinical perspective, this could be a pattern detection, which what I mean by this is diagnose itself, adenocarcinoma, Hashish brain disease, inflammation or feature detection, if we are just wanted to focus on something like neural invasion or something like this. Or it could be identifying of immune histochemistry markers like, well, for example, multi-slide instability or ER or BR scores, for example. There's different classification of how these algorithms work, and there's no way that we go through all of them, but I just want you to be familiar with a couple of more important one of them, which is detection, classification, segmentation, quantification, and localization. So now I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So this is, for example, an example of detection classification. And in this example of detection task, where the model is detecting metastatic breast cancer and lymph node, and also shown with a heat map visualization over the area of the image that the metastatic carcinoma is identified in red. Another great example of detection is actually in the field of microbiology or acid fast bacillus. So who would not mind having an automated acid fast bacillus pre-screened to save I would say hundreds of hours per year. This publication actually looked at the training model to detect astrophosphatellas in digital pathology and it had a very high probability resolution. Another one is the classification pattern. So this example shows metastatic carcinoma in lymph node with three varying prediction and association confidence. The model trained to detect many various primary as well as metastatic tumor types. And as you can see here, the model is almost 99.96% sure that this is colorectal carcinoma, almost 0.003 may be sure that this is from esophagus origin, and it's almost certain that it's not from endometrial carcin. One of the actually like the features that the model created by its own self, guess what? Is the luminal necrosis, the extensive luminal necrosis. So that actually the model, to figure out what we know as the pathologist, that the colorectal cancer is associated with necrosis. Other like classification is the segmentation one, and as you can see here, the model classified carcinoma versus epithelium versus stroma versus adipose tissue, and even versus background. Another models or another AI models is localization, and this is extremely important when it comes to a very fast um, workflow like frozen. So if you can actually scan the slides and detects exactly and fast where are the cancer cells instead of just like, you know, cruising around the whole slide to figure out where we are. The second one is the prediction modeling. So here in this example, you can see that the prediction model is actually predicting the survivor. Prediction modeling is, is another part of data analysis in which like AI can be used to analyze big data sets from patient information and clinical and pathological data combining together. It can show us what we cannot see with our eyes. It can show human what is not visualized because of different dimensions of the data that we have. In this publication, for example, it's a renal cell carcinoma. The machine was able to highlight the sarcomatoid growth of these cells and link it to the survivor pattern and like the age of morbidity and, morbidity, morbidity and mortality for these patients. Now, let's shift gears to the time consuming and quality control. 
Time consuming will be something like mitosis counting and who of us like from different diagnosis pattern doesn't want to like count these things that take a lot of time. Hirschberg disease, for example, in children hospitals is very important because you keep like scanning and recutting and recutting all these slides and you end up with like hundreds and hundreds of slides to make sure that you don't have a ganglion cell. Quality control even is important now and there's a lot of companies that's working on that. Something like anemone detection or for example flag slides that has bubbles or cover slips errors. Or rapid detection of area of interest, which is again the turnaround time is important in frozen section. But even the prediction modeling is just not for the slides themselves. They can actually work in the workflow that we have. So now we have models that we use to count how the patient volume that we have and equivalent of how many staffing that we need for next year. So here's an example of the quantification of mitosis and the subsequent quantification of the numerical count. And as you can see here, it got like a really focusing on what is like mitosis or not. But what's great about this publication that the R model or like the moment of truth, which is the pathologist, had a huge inter-observer variability. However, the machine did not. And after reviewing these cases a couple of times by the pathologist, they all reached the same conclusion that the, that the AI reached in the first place. Over here in this example is another AI for mitosis detection in breast cancer and several other diseases. So mitotic count verification is included in the station criteria. And in this model, for example, AI model was able to be increased the efficiency in quantification in breast cancer almost more than 30% than human eye. Another example that we discussed for the localization, as I told you, in turnaround time, in like uh, a fast turnaround time, like frozen. So the machine was an innocently was able to create or to detect a different pattern and tell us where is the cancer in this slide. Now, let's move to the image managing system, which we will talk about it later in when it comes to the vendor, but I will focus now on the robots and the scanner. So robots in general are currently automated certain tasks. The robots are just used to operate like a certain workflow. Maybe slight scanning from like the moment that we have the physical slide to the moment that we have it in the image managing system. Or like image analysis for ER or BR and report generation. However, a full robotic automation is not yet, however, I'm telling you honestly, to be determined very soon. There's a lot of company now have this holistic approach of creating the whole department or the whole workflow of pathologists in an automated fashion. Scanners are not only for H&E anymore. So we have scanners for cytopathology, we have scanners for hempath that can go to up to 10 times X, 100 X the magnification. We have scanners for immune fluorescence, we have for cytogenetics, for microbiology, we have the capacity and the machine to do this, and all of this can actually validate it as your own LDT, and you can work it in your clinical workflow now. Last but not least, when we talk about the pathology use cases, let's talk about what we call clinical decision support, as well as signal conversion or national language processing. So clinical decision support is not per se related to the use of the slides, it's more of the holistic approach of what we have over here. So AI is used to provide a decision support to the pathologist, more information about the external care records. So we have these best practice advisory or these like files in which it can help us to see which patient we will do which test for. So for example, some of pre-authorization decision, like if it's ASCUS, we beat HPV in 12 months. If it's positive, then you do colposcopy. We all are familiar with these like best practice advisory, again, we don't think that these are by default sort of very rudimentary artificial intelligence maneuver. Signal convention, which is natural language processes, an example for this is the dragon that we have in the gross room that will help us like grossing the specimen, but it's also a new technology that we talk about that's helping creating what we call the BCBR or patient-centric patient pathology reports. So over here, this is a good, two examples of clinical decision support in which we are helping our fellow like clinicians not to do the right thing or to do the good thing, which is, for example, preventing them for, go, for ordering lumbar puncture for patients in which we don't have the, like, the literature that support like, such invasive maneuver. 
when it comes to signal conversion or natural language processing, I would first rely, remind all of you that recently, in the last few years, we implemented the 21st Century Act. And based on the 21st Century Act, patients have an access to their data directly through my, my chart. And I always use the story that Dr. Eric Connick mentioned to me before, that one time he was actually signing a Morocco report of EGFR case, only a few days later to find a patient knocking on his door in the second floor in the CB, asking him, could you please explain to me what did this mean? He didn't go to his oncologist, he didn't go to the surgeon, he straightforward went to the pathologist. Thankfully, he was not hostile and there was nothing wrong, but this actually happened because now the patients have these stories about what is EGFR for them. So there's a new concept of patient-centric patient report in which we need to explain to the patients terminologies that we use something like a button surgeon margin. What does this mean? CD4 positive, what does this mean? Neurovascular invasion, is this a good cancer for me or is it a bad cancer? So the new concept of patient-centric pathology reports is using natural language processing to train a lot of models to switch these big words for normal population to smaller words. And here's actually a couple of publications that was produced actually by Larry over here, as well as Libby, as well as Mark from our department that's trying to work on this. So the whole idea is giving the patients some information about what is the meaning of their um, cancer, what the meaning of their pathology report. And even to expand this, there's also a PCRR, or pathology centric radiology report, in which this company, for example, are trying to give all these like medical terminology to the patient. What's the meaning of contrast? What's the meaning of CT? What's the meaning of MRI? Why my doctor choose CT, not choose MRI? So actually, these companies are doing this now. However, signal conversion and BCBR is a good, really good like turn over to talking about what we call like the machine shifting the game now, which is, let's start talking about the national language processing, which is pretty much is an AI, an AI branch that computer, it's focusing on computer understanding what human means. This is what's natural language processing. There's a certain subdivision of natural language processing called language modeling, which is pretty much determined the probability of a given sequence of the word. So for example, when you are writing your email and saying like, oh, as soon as, the machine will know the end of the sentence is as soon as possible. Or when you are trying to say sincerely, it will directly put your signature or something like this. This is a very rudimentary basic of this. But language modeling became very oriented and very comprehensive now enhanced by what we call the neural network of steroids, so they start building on these like big model now. As I mentioned before, in 2017 was the introduction of a certain subdivision of neural network called the transformers, and these transformers are capable of what we call battery processing sequencing, in which it does not go in a sequent fashion analysis all these words, it actually go to all these words individually and give every word of them a value and start by giving different organization and giving different volumes of these values to personally, without any intervention of a human, to see what is important and which word is more important than the other one. And this is what we call the mechanism of self-attention. So these models can weigh the importance of different words based on their relevance. And honestly, a lot of data scientists now believe that the invention of the transformers in 2017 is the one of the most important innovation in this century, and it's even equal to the innovation of like browser in the 90s, for example, because it transferred the generative modeling now to a different area that we don't know. And these, again, are the main key player in ChatGPT or this new modeling of artificial intelligence. So, speaking about ChatGPT, it's a chatbot. It doesn't like difference from when you are calling your provider service and you find like a robot say like, breeze, hold one, breeze, hold two. It's the same basic thing, but of course on steroids. However, AI chatbot or deployed open, it was deployed by OpenAI in November 2022, and guess what? Within five days, it has it hit all his its one million user. Facebook had this number by ten months. Instagram had this number by two point five months. ChatGPT in five days, impressive. So it's the, the idea itself, the ability in prediction, the outcome of like 
the outcome based on millions of modeling technology. So ChatGPT, for example, 4, which is just was released a few weeks ago, actually have more than 100 trillion parameters, which is a huge number. Imagine that it used all these different values to get the idea or know what you mean in a milliseconds. And this is why the powerful component out of this new modeling. So it's not only just what we call language modeling anymore. It's something called LLM, or it's your large language modeling that can predict all of these things now. However, the desired outcome is based on the available resources. So for example, if I have a time now, I can open the chat GBT and I Google myself. I Google like Karim Hosni is a pathologist and left it. Since the model does not have actually like the basic information from 2022 versus 2019, so chat GBT believe that I'm still in Philadelphia even that I'm actually here in Seattle now. Ironically enough, ChatGPT used the official UW beige to say that I am in UW. So it took the word from UW beige about like, he's a medical director of AB Informatics, he's currently in Philadelphia. So he used the word of UW, but he, it links me to Philadelphia somehow. Okay, so what's the importance of this moving forward for the pathology? There's this new idea which is predicting the pathology report. Right now, we have training large models. What if we trained large data models on external health database, like the Epic Warehouse, for hundreds and hundreds of houses or hospitals that are using, like Epic Now, billions of healthcare data points using 100 trillion of parameter. So here's the recipe, radiology, pictures, history of patients, gross image and H and E. Voila, here it is, a pathology report. So pretty much like the chat GPT will come to you and tell you like, based on millions and millions of data point, I believe that this is the pathology report. But again, it can end up having like, oh, this is the adenocarcinoma of breast, but it's in the brain, or it's adenocarcinoma of female in an email. So it will always just give you data based on the pattern, but you don't make sure if you have it or not. Before going about the use of all these things, I want just to take you for a little bit journey about the vendor products now. And again, I have zero conflict of interest with any of these companies. I just want to make sure to give you an idea about what we have on service now. If you or your workflow is important or do you believe one of these companies is important for your workflow, please contact me. I would love to discuss it with you and tell you what's available over there. So these, like there's literally more than, I don't know, like hundreds or dozens of these pictures over the world. So it's hard to like to talk about all of them. However, roughly talking, we can talk that they are all running into three different products when it comes to anatomical pathology. It's either algorithm or image management system or scanners and robots. So when it comes to algorithms, either for diagnosis or for quality control, we have to start with beige AI. So Beige AI is the only FDA approved AI for breast diagnosis. It's pretty much the only artificial intelligence start company that has a model for cancer to detection. <coughs> and since it's the only one that has this FDA approved, of course it has like a lot of like strings in the companies now. And guess what? It's the only company that one of the big players like Microsoft considered the correlation with it. So other companies actually, even that they are doing this, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, all these companies start to understand that these companies have a very potential profitable solution and they start engaging with this. Now, PhysioPharm, for example, I like that they have three different models. The first one is the Qualtiplex, which is actually focusing on the staining consistency of your pattern. So if you have HER2 or ER or BR, it will make sure that the stain that you have is equally and you don't have variation between these stains. Onctoplex is actually a la carte. You built your own algorithm. And also the Onctoplex, they actually built their own algorithm and they validated for LDTUs clinically or for research, of course which is KI67, ERBR, HER2, BDL1, and metastasis. IBX has three different models, one for detection of prostate cancer, one for breast, and one for gastric. Beige AI also focusing on quality contrast uh, models, something like tissue falls, for example, as, as here in this picture, and the biomarker quantification also of BDL1, HER2, ERBR, and KI67. Moving to image managing system. So the first one is Fujifilm, for example, and they are very proud of their open system that can cooperate with radiology images for Daikin AI models, for example. 
Indica, it's one of my favorite, has a case-centric models. And this case-centric model will allow blind scoring between different pathologists, as well as case and slide tagging, not only whole like patient tagging, and it has a very nice ergonomic view as well. Brosha, for example, is proud that they were able to decrease the pathology time by 2.4 times. Cresta is very proud of their pioneering pixelation streaming technology and in which like their digital slides has a really nice non-pixelation power as well as their patent virtual slide staging in which because a lot of pathologists they are still missing the feeling of like moving the slides under the microscope and stuff like this so they created this feeling so you will not miss your old friend the microscope. Last but not least, the best presenter, which is actually not a company per se, but it's like an initiative that was done by a couple of pathologists for different academic institutes. They have a multi-end user models and they have hyper presentation. I personally really love the QR coder uh, potentials. And if you don't believe me, if you can scan this actual code that you see in front of you now, you can see instant slide in front of you. And this one doesn't matter if it's like 30 gigabyte or 40 gigabyte you will see the digital slide in front of you and you can play with it as much as you want. So imagine now I'm sending you this QR code while you are in the Bahamas, like in, enjoying your mojitos and someone's asking about like the diagnosis of this or even if you have like a cooperation with, with places in Africa or in Asia. So this is, can really implement like international consultation and international uh, cooperation. Now, scanners and robots, we have high resolution digital slides now. It can go for up to more than 40 or even 100 now. The scanners are on all levels, so the whole idea of Z-stacking is rudimentary now. We can do scanner using the Z-stacking technology. And we have a very high speed like scanners now. So let's start with the bread and butter, the one that we have now, the Leica Ebru GT450. 32 second slides, it can scan 80 slides per hour. However, if you want to go dive deeper, here's the Scobio company, which is focusing actually on heme bath and cytopathology. You can scan up to 100x with this machine. Olympus, for, on the other side, is a really nice company for immune fluorescence, in which you can scan immune fluorescent slides. And they have their own AI algorithm to detect like glomeruli and pancreatic islands in these immune histochemistries. Uh, come and his immune histochemistry um, stains. I will leave you with this company which is called Parmana. Parmana is not scanners per se, but it's more of evolution of a workflow. So it's actually a robot company. And you can see from the picture here, you can see like there is, oh, like there is, oh, here, let me use this. Can I use this? Do you see? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so if you see this, yeah, awesome. So if you see, this is actually the robots in the middle that actually taking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of slides and feed them directly into these four scanners behind it. So they are very proud that they are actually affiliated with Duke and my clinic to archive 14 million slides, which is an amazing number, honestly. And they're also very well known in the reduction of operating intervention and imaging errors that's less than 10%. Now let's shift gears to what is really important, which is ethical consideration. We have all this technology, and with great powers come great responsibility, as they are saying. So the first thing that you need to think about ethical consideration is these models are fragile and can be broken very, very easy. Few changes in the input is, can create significant change in the output. And, and as you see in this example over here, this Google algorithm was actually manipulated by just changing very few pixelation of the cat around the eyes in the background to make this amazing Google algorithm believe that this cat is a guacamole. And everyone was laughing when saying that Google cannot differentiate between its tabby from its Tabasco, but it's real. So this is a very important concept that manipulating this data can change and break these models. When this is one of the major strengths in human that the machine will never have, which is the social awareness. Machines can always see the trees, but they will never see the jungle. They cannot see the bigger picture. They cannot understand like what's happening all over like the place. And this is where we can use this in the right way. However, 
Imagine something like this if happening in the healthcare system. Imagine if someone created very tiny manipulation numbers in the insulin bump of patient of diabetic patients. This will lead to catastrophic changes of their like of their of their insulin dose. Second thing is the black box problem, which says we cannot know. Many times we cannot know how the machine reached the, why they reached this conclusion. What is the output or what is the input that led it to take these results? It tells that this is the best option or it tells to go this way or something like the GPS, for example, when you are walking and the GPS decide to take you from point A to point B, why it took the highway? Why it took like the sidewalk? You never know sometimes. So exaggerating this is actually a problem. Some. The third one is the security risk which is, as any other technology, we always can have a security risk. Automation bias, it's something that's, I would call it the, like, um, the technology imposter syndrome problem in which like, we don't want to actually challenge the computer uh, decision, even if we are sure that we are right. Even if we are using our clinical skills and our knowledge and 100% certain the computer takes the wrong decision, sometimes we don't like argue with this. And this is called the automation bias. No human in the loop. And a great example was the two tragedy of the Boeing 737 control system in which there was no human in the loop. The sensor was feeding the wrong data. That led to the deaths of almost 350 people because this AI model was not controlled, or another word, was not augmented by human, and there is no human in the loop. Last, 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 last but not least, as, as any researcher know, garbage in, garbage out. If you give the model wrong data, or you don't know what the model is using this data from, it will give you a really bad result. Do you want an example? Here's a great, like here's an example of someone ask ChatGPT, can you tell me how I can be a good scientist? And guess what? ChatGPT decided like if you are man and white, then you are a good scientist, else you are not a good scientist. So imagine actually having all these pictures or all these examples in front of you and now you will know what is the problem was come to using the AI problem. Do you want a use case? Here's a practical case for you. Pathology residence selection. Why we are trying to choose our residence here. So imagine there's a program director decided to use AI model to choose the best resident to come for his or her program. They decided to get a garbage in, garbage out. So get this code from the internet about if you are male, if you are white, then you are going to residency. If not, else. So the resident company get this. We take it to the EROS application with the filters. So we will filter all these like candidates. We will have no machines, which no human in the loop, and no automated AI system. And I think I don't need to explain the results that we end up we have. So this is an example of what the problem is AI is. Honestly, this slide in particular, I just added yesterday. I was doubting if I should add it or not, but I decided for visibility to add it. So Dr. Jeffrey Hampton, which some people decide is the god of artificial intelligence, and he is the pioneer of the neural network um, technology, he actually resigned Google last week. And he left Google with a warning of danger ahead. And in his statement, he mentioned the importance of how to really manage technology and not see it. And he explained the new concept, which is not keep human in the loop, but keep good human in the loop. What he mean by this, that the, business, the models, the end users that we have for AI now, the, almost all of them is business models. We don't have end users except to create more like financial incentive. And this wall between all these companies now can lead to catastrophic like um, results. Also, he was very focusing on the use the, uh, or the, the, use, the, the use of huge influx of new, what he calls pseudo facts created by AI. So by the way, all the picture that you saw in this presentation, I created using artificial intelligence. But now it's part of the public library and the part of the knowledge. So all these pseudo pictures, pseudo videos, fake text, first of all, for human, you don't know what's right and what's wrong anymore. You don't know like what's reality anymore. However, for machine, now it's feeding itself over and over fake information. 
The machine is creating new models based on fake models, based on fake models, what we can call an infinite black box effect. So with all of that, we have to create what we have, what we can call the AI six ethical commitments. The first one is the transparency. Why? Why we are doing this? Second one is the explainability. So in how we are doing this, merging how and why, you get the intelligibility. Beneficiary, we all have it in healthcare. Maximize benefit, minimize risk. Audibility is we need to monitor these AIs and know how the, we are using them. Accountability is the having an entity that you can come back and ask why you are doing this and ask for their like uh, responsibility of this. You need someone that has the power to turn off or turn on like the machine. Last but not least, we will talk about like how actually you can implement any of the artificial models in, or digital pathology in your implementation. So first, you need to understand again why. Why we are doing this? Is it just like because it's like look nice to me? No. You need to know what's your call. So right now we do the improved image analysis and we do all this analysis. Next, we need to improve the survivor. Not the future, I would say the present. These models are currently available now to certify patients for precision medicine. And this is what actually Jeffrey was talking about, the end user, not for business model. We are trying to create a precision medicine modeling for our patients. So if this is our idea of AI, then we can enhance on it. But just running out without a why is very dangerous. Then you need to understand where your structure are. So we have our width lab and built of this, the pathology informatics, like the economic history, the barcoding, all the physical hardware and software, digital pathology, and then the computation analysis or the AI is over here. However, in order for you to create any model or creating any AI workflow, you have to understand there's a lot of moving parts. Engaging image storage with, with, with IT support, with whole slide scanners, with stakeholders, with residents. It's very hard, like it's a very hard workflow and it's not easy to achieve that hard. If you are going to the validation, you need to ensure that the pathology is in, in the loop, not only for human law, but for accountability. But you need to know the relationship between the pathologist and the model and to create what we call the optimum human machine interaction. When you are doing the measuring performance, you need to make it accurate and it's productive because maybe it's accurate, but it will cost more money than the usual workflow that you have. Last but not least, the generalization error. So you need, after you are training this model on a certain data set, you need to know if you can generalize it over like different like data, or is it only work for geo or only work for cytopathology? You need it to work for your whole department. Again, all the workflow components should be assisted together, and the standalone evaluation always fail because you are you don't know what you don't know, or your blind spots that you don't know anything. And when you are creating all these models, you need to talk to your like developer, your data developers, and ask them. What is the rationale? Why you are doing this model? What is your sample size? What's the inclusion exclusion criteria? How missing data was handled? Is it like NA or is it zero? How was the data annotated in the first place? Com give me the reference to understand what is the meaning of this data. And finally, even the technical details like data type or file extension, all these important things to understand what you are doing here. Another very important thing that's extremely important is the change control behavior. You cannot create a new AI models without having the whole like culture around you that's important and improving this. So you have to create an SOB to minimize any change in the pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical things, uh, post-analytical um, changes. Other critical steps to do is training, 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 training. No one will know, uh, like don't assume that everyone know how to use the new technology. Don't just change something and like give it to the end users. A good example would be, for example, PowerPass, for example, that we don't have like a tools to train our new pathologists on our new analytical tools. To give them the training either like online 
or like physically or based on their schedule. And when you are doing a change, you need to have this conversation with all the stakeholders. You are doing it in phases or you are doing it in Big Bang. Because maybe you will think Big Bang is better, but it maybe affects your like workflows. In conclusion, digital pathology and artificial intelligence are here to stay and we continuously transform the delivery to precision medicine. Digital pathology and AI have shown increased accuracy and reduced diagnostic variability and improve efficiency in diagnostic medicine. With the upcoming AI, it is time for pathologists to step up. It's time to be not only part of the team, but actually to be the leader of the team because we are the one that have the capacity to create a precision medicine management skills for the whole hospital. And the transition into digital pathology practice should happen now, and we always plan and decision to physically even be responsive, proactive, and innovative, rather than just be forced on this digital pathology should stop now. Last but not least, technology will always come back. Technology will always have something new to us. Technology will always help us to improve things or terrify us. And it will always do the same three words that terrorize my childhood when I was a cat. I'll be back. But it is not the strongest of the species that survive, not the most intelligent one, but the one that's responsive to change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kareem, for that wonderful uh, overview. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. So, Kareem, one of the things I keep wondering about is how solid a definition ground truth is. Yeah. So, the question is about how ground truth is. You know, you can refer to a group of pathologists that are going great in prostate cancer and it's all over them. And how many people do you need to? I would say that there is no definition of ground truth actually, because if the ground truth is what the definition, what the pathologists are seeing now, for example, the mitosis cases, if you have all the pathologists that we have here in a single slide to count the mitosis count, you will have different numbers. However, the machine will have a fixed number if it has the same algorithm over and over and over. So, do you think that the ground truth is now with the machine? I don't think so. The ground truth is actually a dynamics process in which you build it and you create an instant ground truth for you now that will change later to whatever best for you. So that's my understanding of ground truth at least. So I had another question about the uh, interoperability of the various algorithms. So you mentioned that there are several um, commercial companies that are you know, in this space, the very, the very dynamic space. So if we were thinking about like the page AI, the FDA approved diagnostic uh, adjunct, does that mean that that should then be uniformly ruled out everywhere to be interoperable versus if there's a competitor, how comparable would they be? Right? Great, great question, which is, Again, it was related for the ground truth, but this time for business model perspective. BHAI, for example, it doesn't, it's a good advertising for them that they are FDA approved. However, it's not for, it, it's, doesn't, it's not the ground truth to use the word FDA approved as like a key changer of what we choose. When you are building all these algorithms, you are first of all, someone will say like FDA approved, but when you dig deeper in these papers, you say like, no, it's FDA approved or it's approved for certain specific age, for certain specific race, for certain specific models. Our patient population here in UW is different from Philadelphia, it's different from a children's hospital, it's different from community hospital. So just the word FDA approved by itself is not like the like the, 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 the golden word or the, like the golden stem that we make us allowed. I personally, one of the like, very favorite of the customized solution because my patient here is different from my patient in New Ben, is different from other patients. So implementing an LDT based on your best case scenario, on your need, on your patients, on your workflow. Maybe you don't have the ability to scan the slide the same way that Beige wants. 
Beach, for example, they actually ask you to get, send the slides to them, and then they give you the algorithm. This business workflow, I don't think it's ideal for UW, for example. Maybe it's ideal for another community hospital. So should I go with the FDA beige one, or should I go with an LDT one that will allow me the um, intellectual property of my own digital slides? No, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, mean, the, I don't an expect an answer for that because we don't know, right? But, but I think it's going to be an issue that, that there are systems that you know, are generating a value or an answer or an agnostic based on certain criteria. It's hard to potentially compare across uh, systems as well. Absolutely. It's yes. What we have is you will be able to compare, but again, you will not do know what is the ground truth. You will not know what is the right one. Like you will not, because like beige will have its own certain population of prostate cancer diagnosis over here, and you can create your own LDT with even not a company. You can do it in house, okay? And this patient population is different. So the problem is you will end up, as you were saying, having to compare because very much you are comparing apple to oranges. So it's not the same thing. It's not just the word prostate cancer. As we all pathologists know, it's never just the word cancer. A right. couple of uh, chat questions. May I read them to you? Yeah. So, um, David, how about the ethics of the origin of the data used for training these models? There's the question of patient consent to use their tissue and their organs to train a for-profit program. Right. This is a great question that's very controversial, unfortunately. So some people will say that in academic hospitals, when these patients are signed per se research, this is including per for their um, ability to be involved in the studies. However, some other people are actually saying, no, it's not, no, it's not. Like this is the new, it's not like just the classic research that we used to do anymore. The problem now is, this modeling and this generative data analysis, it's trip, it gives the information from the patient by, but yet stripping their identification. So there's models that big companies like Epic, for example, they absolutely don't have patient information, but yet they get the essential information that they need as the parameters to create their models. This is, a very, this is why there's actually a lot of initiative motions now, and I can actually like uh, refer you to a couple of like articles, a white paper about the ethics of use AI in healthcare. And there's actually an initiative that's moved now by the congressman to create a light of like something like the career regulation, how to use AI in healthcare. Another question from this is from Erica Johnlin. Fantastic presentation. I have a question about how to overcome the human fear of challenging the computer's decision. How do we deal with that? I currently see this with people not willing to do simple math without a calculator. Exactly. Thank you, Erica, for explaining this. So you always, the human nature, you will always have the area adapter and you will always have like the, like people that will have or will fear from new technology. That's, that's just our nature, our, our beautiful nature that we have all of this. So you will never have like a standardized fashion between all of them. However, the one thing that I can say for sure that through our whole history, we always adapted to a new technology. Machines in the 90s, calculator in the, eight, in the 19th century, calculator in the 80s of this century, Uber, spam emails, nuclear weapons, all of them, we overcome and we models to actually use this for our own benefits. So as long as we have the scale of adaptation and honestly the social awareness that can tell us the difference between guacamole and the cat, so we will always outperform Generally speaking, the machine learning of the AI-like technology, and we can use it for us. It's just like the amount of try. So. What well, I think may be a final question, Kareem. Whoops, oh, follow up from Erica. How do we overcome fear of questioning the computer's decision? This is why I call it like the technology or like the, like the, I don't know, I don't have like a terminology for it, but there's a, certain term in psychology called the imposter syndrome. 
and this is the technology imposter syndrome in which you are just questioning yourself and questioning your ability and now you have this great thing that's called AI, computer, like machine learning and you are afraid to imposter it and you are questioning your own ability. So the same way that we can overcome our questioning of our own decision, the same way that we can like overcome the computer. Because guess what, the computer is a tool for us. It is not equal or it's not like um, something that's equally can be overcome for us. Not yet, not yet. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe the Terminator movie will end up being true, and in this case, we were all gonna die. But realistically speaking, it's just the tool that we have now, no matter or no less. And the tool you can use the same way for a good way or a bad way. Last, last question. Um, Excellent presentation. What do you think about the authenticity and reliability of future medical literature generated by AI? Should AI be included in the author list, or is there a need for a disclaimer when used? I really think there is a need of disclaimer to be used. I really believe in this. I really believe that there is a need of disclaimer to be used now. Because of all this data modeling technology, again, the same thing that Jaffrey was talking about. We are creating pseudo facts for each for ourselves. So right now, uh, unfortunately, I wanted actually to show you this. If you ask ChatGPT, where's Kareem Hosni? It will tell you that like it's he is now in Philadelphia. But guess what? Now there is an outsourced data created by ChatGPT saying that I am in Philadelphia. What if another AI model used this output as its own input? And the third one used the third input, so the third output, and another input. You may end up having like hundreds of pages on the internet that saying that I'm in Philly, even though I'm in Seattle. Now, what is the grand truth, as you were saying? Because you have all this data that's saying that I'm one thing, while realistically I'm different. So there must be a very clear validation, there must be a very clear disclaimer of how to use these in healthcare. Thank, thank you so much. I think that, that's a tremendous presentation, I think, leading us to think about a lot of things. And one of them will be, hey, when do we start using AI for diagnosing prostate cancer? Uh, what about tomorrow? <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for their participation.